Clint, you're a father and a husband. And right now, your life has an expiration date. Right now, there's a doctor out there saying that you're not going to make it. Knowing that you would be leaving your wife and son behind, how does it make you feel to know that there are people out there that are saying that you can't beat this thing, that you can't win? Thirty-eight-year-old Clint Darden, a former professional strongman currently residing with his wife and son on the island of Cyprus, located south of Turkey in the Mediterranean Sea. Once every few years, Clint returns home to Murray, Kentucky to visit his friends and family. He arrives bearing open arms to his mother and father, with his wife Nephi and his young son Stephen at his side. In the eighth month of his chemotherapy treatment, Clint suffers from a rare and very severe form of ulcerative colitis. This condition renders him weak and tired, his stomach never at rest, leaving him in a perpetual state of extreme pain and discomfort. But despite the pain, Clint remains as physically active as his body will allow, never missing more than a week without getting under a barbell. On a rainy summer afternoon, Kentucky born and raised, Clint Darton told his story. I think most people know, generally, I hope you know who I am. Uh, my name is Clint Darden. I'm originally from Murray, Kentucky in the USA. Uh, 11 years ago, I moved overseas to this little tiny island called Cyprus, and I've been living the trophy life uh, ever since. My wife is Greek Cypriot, so she kind of imported me over to the other side of the world. Uh, coming over here to the States every couple of years is, is actually a lot of fun. It's a pretty big blessing. Uh, 30 let's say 37, I'll be 38 in a couple of days. So I'm uh, young enough to get myself in trouble, but old enough to know better. Talk about your history in athletics from when you were young, you know, as a kid, what sports did you play? Uh, how did it evolve to the point where you became, you know, the internationally recognized athlete that you are today? Let's face it, you are an internationally <laughs> recognized athlete, whether you like it or not, you have a huge fan following. <laughs> Uh, you know, people consider it an honor, you know, to get to meet you and get to work out with you, obviously, and, and it's a big deal to people. And so you've really built a name for yourself. So let's talk about the story of how you got to where you are today, beginning way back when. Well, you know, I've, I've been involved in sports. I played basketball when I was four. You know, being from Kentucky, everyone wants to play basketball. Um, let's, let's also, let's have you direct your focus at me because you okay. it's your habit to look at the camera. Right. Look at me. Okay. Okay. Um, let's have you start that. Okay. Here. You know, I'm from Kentucky. So at age four, I began playing basketball. I think everyone from Kentucky wants to play basketball. We all have that dream of being a Kentucky Wildcat and, and, you know, shooting the three. So, you know, from being a little kid, I, you know, was dribbling a basketball all my life. Wasn't that great, but I tried real hard. My dad was an amazing baseball player. So I tried baseball for several years. Um, and I was just terrible at baseball. Uh, as I got older, I guess when I was eight years old, a lot of my friends were beginning training in Taekwondo. So I began training in Taekwondo right off the bat at eight, trained for three years, got my black belt, uh, two bronze medals at the Junior Olympics in Taekwondo, went to an open karate tournament and lost my first fight and uh, switched immediately to competing in open martial arts. And I guess over the next 15 years of doing that, I went from being the worst in America uh, to being ranked number two in fighting. So it, at that point, everything I did in life was to get better at being a fighter. Uh, and in one of my fights, I ripped the entire rector on the left side of my spine. Um, so part of my rehab was just me getting better um, 
you know, trying to rehab my entire left erector. And that, that meant me going to the gym. So I hired a trainer and the next thing you know, my addiction went from fighting to just training in the gym, getting bigger, getting stronger and, and, and everything uh, gym wise. Talk about your history in the sport of strongman uh, before you you got sick. Uh, you had competed. You said that you had uh, competed against Poundstone. Uh, that he went you went pro a year before him. Talk about that. I was let me see. I was the first American to win a platinum a platinum plus contest in the United States. So I was the first person to earn their pro card. Um, at a Platinum Plus contest. Uh, Nick Cortad actually beat me at Nationals that year, which was the first opportunity for any American to actually earn a pro card. Before that, they just kind of gave them away. Any amateur that wanted to compete as a pro just signed up at a pro show and, and went and competed. Um, and, and they kind of changed that. I was one of the guys picked to win Nationals that year, and it just didn't work out. I had one of those, one of those days where it starts out great, and you just start digging a hole, and it gets worse and worse and worse. By the end of the day, I had an IV in my arm, um, and they carried me out to do the, to do the, the fifth event, um, the Conan's Wheel, and uh, they carried me back to my chair when I was done. So um, when, I, when I won my pro card, I actually beat David Oslin, seven-time finalist at the World's Strongest Man. I beat him by 14 points in a four-event contest. Um, granted, he was really young and really skinny at the time, but as Dave knows, I'm never going to forget that, that I always beat him. By, I actually told him the other day, I said, I, re I remember beating you by 14 points at a four-event contest. And he reminded me that I beat him at Nationals sick a few months before that. So, um, you know, that, I, I really took off there. And at that point, I wanted to focus on school and graduating because I'd already put seven years into my four-year college degree. So it was really time for me to buckle down and, and finish school. Uh, so I wanted to take that time off and, and come back and, and really just focus on school. Had to come back and compete again uh, at Boston, which is where Poundstone, Derek Poundstone, I watched him turn pro at that contest. Uh, but I, you know, I, during that time, I met my wife, moved overseas, kind of ran into a situation to where I was an American, living in Europe, didn't really have any opportunities. Uh, strongman wise and, and I had to get back out there and, and make some connections in Europe just so I could go out and compete again. What what is ulcerative colitis it's ulcerative colitis. Yeah, I you know this is it's one of those diseases you know I have ulcerative colitis and it is one of those diseases that does not get a lot of attention. Um, and everyone always says, yeah, I've got a cousin with that or I've got a friend with that and you know they drank this drink and it cured them. Um, basically the truth is it, it works just like cancer. Uh, there is no cure. There you know nobody's ever been cured. Um, it's not going to happen, and that's a hard reality. The, the side effects, to be absolutely blunt, you know, it's, it's diarrhea 10 times a day. That's it. That's how you spend the rest of your life. If you've ever had the flu and you've spent most of your entire day or week in the bathroom with diarrhea and vomiting and cramping, that's been my life for the last nine years every single day. Um, that's become the norm for me. And it's not just me. I mean, it's hundreds of thousands of people in the United States that go through the exact same thing. The problem is, it's a situation where people are really too embarrassed to talk about it. Um, because nobody wants, you know, some pretty young little girl doesn't want to explain to the rest of the world that she has to run to the toilet to use the bathroom every 30 minutes, every day for the rest of your, the rest of your life. You know, you're looking at someone like me, you know, I deadlifted 821. I deadlifted over 800 pounds every week in the gym for probably two years. And you know, you look at me and I, you know, I'm 300 pounds and I'm big and I'm strong and I'm lifting 500 pound Atlas stones. It's hard to switch gears and say, now I have a weakness. You know, I've got something else, you know, I have to fight. Um, I was probably, 
at the peak of my athletic career in strongman, I was at that point where I had a shot um, at being one of those guys. Like at the, I, I had a shot at having a shot of going to Worlds. You know, I, I was, I was, you know, at least I felt I was one of those guys that, that really had a big opportunity, um, and just began getting sick, began losing weight. You think it's the flu? Um, doctor gives you, you know, some kind of medicine. Take this, you're going to get better, and it doesn't work. Six months later, you take a new medicine. It says you're going to get better, and it doesn't work. Um, the truth is, you know, hope is small. Uh, there, there, there is no cure, and, and it's not like any other disease. You don't get well. The best you can hope for is, is just remission or a short time period where you're going to feel better. You know, I've been sick all day. Um, the best part of my day was right there in the squat rack. That's it. That's the best part of my day. Um, Sometimes that's the only good thing that happens to me all day. The rest of my day, I'm on the couch. I'm sick. I'm, you know, I'm throwing up. I have diarrhea. Um, I wasn't supposed to make it through 2014. I had an expiration date, and I've, I've passed one of those two expiration dates that I was not supposed to pass. So, you know, it, it's, it's a blessing. I, I have a lot of things that I wanted to accomplish and I wanted to achieve as far as, you know, I want to deadlift 880 you know, 400 kilos, um, wanted to squat a grand. And I'm not saying that I won't, but it looks pretty slim. So, you know, you start chopping away those things that you want to do until you get down to what you have left. And the only thing that I've got left is the ability to train. So every chance that I have that opportunity just to get in the gym and train, I take, you know, the most advantage of it as I possibly can. And I love being under a barbell. I don't care if it's 100 pounds or 1,000 pounds. I love being under. I love having my hands on. I love the smell. Um, I love the guys yelling at me in the gym. I live for it. It's the best part of my day. I can't, I can't understand how people don't love that. So it, as, as bitter as I am, uh, as much as I hate the situation, as angry as I am as the situation that I'm in, I have to be happy that I have the opportunity to go in and do something because there's a lot of people that can't do anything. You said that you have had an expiration date twice and that you've already surpassed one of them. Does that mean you have another expiration date right now? I've got one coming up that I'll pass in the next few months. Talk about that. You're a father and a husband. And you have an expiration date coming up. There are doctors out there telling you that you, you are not going to make it past a certain time. And yet you know that you have a wife and you have a son that you would be leaving behind you know talk talk about that how does that make you feel to know that there's a doctor out there saying that you're not going to make it in in 2007 to say i was sick would be a great understatement i went from lifting a 500 pound atlas stone i couldn't get my 160 pound atlas stone off the ground couldn't clean a 200 pound log um, it would take me half an hour to get out of bed uh, my joints are still swollen and painful um, even back from, from that time. And my doctor, I'm talking to him and I'm explaining to him, my, my problem was I want to get back in the gym. I'm not getting stronger. And his response was simply find another hobby. And that's not acceptable. First of all, you don't call what I do a hobby. This, you can call it a sickness if you want to. You can call it something absolutely crazy and insane if you want to, but you don't call this a hobby for me. And you don't tell me to find something new. You know, I want solutions. If you don't have a solution, then get out of my way. So I am going to surpass uh, this next date. It's not an option. Um, people talk about just that people are inspired by the fact that I went and squatted. And I don't get that. It's just a squat. You know, don't, I'm, I am not inspirational. I'm just a guy that is doing exactly what he wants to do. So anytime I have the opportunity to do exactly what I want to do, then that's exactly what I'm going to do. And I'm going to get into the bar and I'm going to squat. I'm going to bench press. I'm going to deadlift. When I'm healthy enough, I'm going to go over there. I'm going to lift stones. They've got a 400-pound stone sitting behind me, and it's itching me to go over there and lift it right now. I know I can't, but it's killing me because I want to. Um, people talk about what I do as being tough. What I do is not tough. Um, deadlifting, you know, I, here on this platform, I deadlifted 650 for three the other day. And that's like 200 pounds below my max. 
you know, and everyone in the gym was looking at me like that's some amazing lift. The biggest lift I've, I ever have to do every week is on Friday night after chemo. It's three o'clock in the morning and I feel like hell. And my son is passed out of sleep on the couch and I have to carry him up 23 stairs. I know it's exactly 23 stairs. I feel like death. And there's a seven year old boy counting on me to carry him up 23 stairs to his bed every Friday night. And I feel like, like death, but I'm gonna do it. Um, you know, I'm in a lot of pain. At, right now, I hurt everywhere. I literally hurt everywhere in my body. But the worst pain I've ever had when I first started chemo, I was having some really rough days on the couch where I didn't get off the couch for a long time, um, for days. And my in-laws came and got my son and took him up to visit some other relatives. And I have no idea what their conversation was in the car. But when my son came back home, he ran in the door crying and just gave me a hug with tears coming down his face. And I don't know what the conversation was for him but me seeing him come in the door and he has that look like he's going to lose his dad, that's tough. A squad is not tough. Seeing your son like that is tough. My son asking me questions like, Dad, why are you so tired now? You used to have so much energy. That's tough. How do you answer that question? I don't, I don't have the answer, um, except, you know, I'm going to get better. That's, that's it, you know. Saturdays when I feel like death and I'm, I'm exhausted and tired and my son says, Dad, let's go out and play. You know, let's get the water guns and go outside and shoot each other. I can't say no. You know, the only thing that I want to do is lay on the couch and just, just be. And, and, and that's it. And, and I've got a seven-year-old son that says, Dad, let's go outside and play. That's tough. You know, that's, but people call me an inspiration, but I'm no different than the guy who works 60 hours a week to feed his children. Let's put a pin on that and go back to it. Your card's up. Okay, completely up? Zero, it's not recording anymore. Okay, I've, so, got another, I've got another card I can exchange. I'll grab it for you if you want so you can stay right there. <clears throat> People say that you're an inspiration uh, for training through the pain. Talk about that. Yep. People say I'm an inspiration for training through pain and inspiration for squatting and deadlifting and bench pressing and lifting atlas stones. You know, I, am, I am no different than everybody else out in the world. I'm no different than that guy that works 60 hours a week to put food on the table for his kids. The only difference between me and them is I have a camera on me almost all the time and I put it out there and people get to see my life. Um, I used to hide everything that I went through for so many years because nobody wants to talk about, nobody wants to hear about somebody who is always sick. You know, we always have that friend who is always sick who always has the flu, who's always injured, and we all get tired of hearing about it. So I kept everything and just hid it from the rest of the world. And I think I realized that I can make a difference. I can get people to understand that it's okay to be sick. It's okay to stand up and say, look, I'm never gonna be cured. You know, no, you can't cut this out, you can't fix it, you can't do anything. This is never gonna get better, it's never gonna go away. I am sick, this is the way it's gonna be, nothing's gonna change. Um, the only thing that's going to change is me and I can change the rest of the world just by being me. How does that make you feel? To me, when I do, I mean, I don't know if you know my, my background of, uh, what I would say would be pretty substantial charity work. Uh, I did about 40 events in the course of about a year and a half, all charity truck pulls, plane pulls, uh, car deadlifts. I did one here in Kentucky in Salyersville for a little boy that had, um, uh, cystic fibrosis before he passed. Developed a real good relationship with his family. They actually had me come back down to be the pallbearer at his funeral. So I've, I've buried a nine-year-old boy, which was hard. Um, you know, and I, I had a lot of people that respected me, you know, for, for what I did. And they, they thought, you know, very highly of me. And I realized that there was a lot of responsibility 
that, that came with that. Do you ever feel a sense of responsibility for the other people, the hundreds of thousands that you talked about that are living with ulcerative colitis uh, on a daily basis who maybe don't have the same strength you do to fight? Do you ever feel like you, you have a responsibility or a duty to be strong for them, not just for yourself and not just for your family, but for others who look up to you and aspire to, in a sense, uh, become you? for lack of a better term. It is difficult at times when people send me a message and tell me um, that they depend on me, um, that they look up to me. Uh, they're proud to know me. They're glad that I do what I do. Um, it is a lot of pressure because if I fall and fail, it does feel like there are 100,000 people looking at me saying, you know, why did you do this, you know, or what happened? Um, but there's, I'm no different than anybody else in the world. I am going to fall. I am going to fail. Um, I'm going to slip. The biggest thing that I've, I've learned in the last year is that it's okay to be afraid. I mean, it's absolutely okay to be, I've sat there and looked at myself in the mirror and just said, man, it's all right. You know, you're afraid. It's okay. You want to quit. It's okay. You know, you just want to lay on the couch. That's okay. You're sad. You're depressed. It's okay. And all I see on the internet is, is people saying, you know, suck it up. You know, this whole thing about, you know, be a lion. Everyone says, you know, just be a lion, conquer it, attack it. You know, what does a lion do whenever he doesn't catch the, you know, whenever he doesn't catch that meal for his family? You know, he still goes back home. He's still hungry. Um, even, you know, even a lion falls and fails. Um, you know, I, I can't take the weight of the world on my shoulders. I go back two years ago, and you know my little gym, that's a hole in the wall in Cyprus. We don't even have electricity. We borrow electricity from a neighbor. You know, I had 13 people every training day in my gym. Now it's me, my wife, and our best friend. The only two people that will put up with me when I'm training. Um, but I just I had to quit pleasing people. I had to tell people no. Um, I couldn't give myself to everybody else because at the end of the day, there was nothing left for me. And if I don't take care of me, then I can't take care of my son. I can't take care of my wife. Um, and there won't be a me to take care of. Talk about your son talking to you that day, coming up to you and giving you that hug. Talk about the emotions that ran through your body. Be, we try to relive that moment. You know, really, really get into that moment. Think about it. How did it make you feel? What What did it make you think? Did it make you afraid for yourself, for him? I think as a father, every father wants their child to have something that he didn't, to have a better life. Um... I want my child to never be afraid. I want my son to never be afraid of anything, to know that dad is there. Um, if he falls, dad is right there to pick him up. And it's difficult, I think, for a child to see their dad just, you know, fail or to be sick. And I'm not 70. You know, I'm 37. I'm not old. Um, so I don't, I don't think he understands, you know, what I'm going through. And I don't know how to explain it to him. So the only thing I can do is, is pick up and just keep walking. Because someday he is going to understand. Um, he's going to understand that his dad went through something really, really bad. And his dad didn't quit. I look back now as a father looking at my dad. And, and when I was young, it's, it's easy to criticize your dad. I look back and say, man, my dad did this. My dad. And even now I look back and say, man, my dad has done this and he's done that. But I look back now and think, you know, my dad used to drive 24 hours one way to drive me to a karate tournament. He used to sit in an uncomfortable van and drive me 24 hours each way just so I could fight, win or lose, and you know, then drive me back home and he went to work on Monday. You know, how many dads do that? You know, the pain that he sat through in a car for 24 hours, um, it's, it's really easy to critique a father and I want my son someday to look back at me and realized that I went through something really bad, but I stuck through it. And when he's in a bad situation, 
I want him to look back and say, you know what? My dad was in a really tough situation and he never gave up. Um, I think it's okay for him to see me sick. Um, my son was three years old and I remember waking up one morning and I was bad, bad sick. I could barely, hadn't been to the gym in almost a week and I just woke up and said, that's it. I'm training today. You know, nothing's going to stop me. I remember getting to the gym and it was a squat day, dynamic effort squat day, box squats. And I got under the bar, did the bar, turned around and puked. Did another set with a bar, turned around and puked. Got up to two plates, still puking every set. At that point, the room was spinning. I had to get my son from school. I remember driving to get my son from school with a trash can sitting in the seat next to me in the car. I get my son from school, I take him home, he's playing in the house and I'm sitting in my chair holding this trash can and I've still got the trash can at home. And my three-year-old son climbs up on my knee, three years old, and puts his hand around me and I, his finger touched my shoulder and he said, it's okay, Papa, it's gonna be okay. And I don't know I don't know how a three-year-old learns that. Where, where does that come from? Where does a three-year-old learn to give his dad a hug and say it's going to be okay? Um, but that was probably the first point in my life as a parent to where I realized I'd done something right with my child. When my son could look at another individual and give them a hug and say it's going to be okay, I think he understood compassion and, and understanding. And I think that's all that I really want to do with my son. You know, if, if he can get through life and understand compassion for others, have an understanding for others, and the ability not to quit no matter what, then I think I've done what I need to do as a parent. What if you... What if you don't beat it? Well, I, I'm not going to beat this. What if That's, you... If, 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 if curing this is beating it, then I'm not. If living through this is beating it, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm 37 and I plan on living forever. Um, I've been fighting this disease for almost 10 years. So 10 years, I hope, is a drop in the bucket for the rest of my life. So chemotherapy is an opportunity for me to extend my life. I've been through chemo for eight months. I've got four months left to go. And at that point, we have to go back and reevaluate, do we stay on this forever? Um, is, is it worth it? Or do we have to go a different direction? Um, but I'm almost out of options. Chemotherapy is one of the last options. Um, You know, I, I think about this if, you know, if, if I'm gone by this time next year. You know, I think, what have I done to make the world a better place? What have I left behind? Um, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not done yet. I'm not prepared for that. And I think that's what keeps me going is I've got, some, I've got more stuff that I want to do. And I can't control that. I don't have any control over that. So I just don't think about it. I ignore it. Um, I avoid it. People want to talk to me all the time about me being sick or uh, about circumstances and situations. I just ignore it. You know, people ask me all the time. How many, I can't tell you how many people today have asked me, how do you feel? And, you know, the answer is always the same. I feel fine. You know, it's the biggest lie I tell 10 times a day. I feel fine. I feel terrible. But I'm here. And I was able to train. I'm able to squat. I've got a wonderful wife. I've got a wonderful son. I'm surrounded by friends. I don't know what else I need. When, when is that next expiration date? I'm not gonna tell you. I won't give you that date. I'll tell you when it's gone. Do you think about that date every day? Absolutely. That, that day crosses my mind every day. But it's a meet, it's a competition. That's it. 
All I've got to do is show up and I've got to beat it. That's it. And it's, it's an abstract date given to me by a doctor that I don't believe knows a thing because he gives that date to the average person. You know, the average person comes in, you know, I, you know I, I've torn almost every muscle in my body. I've broken every bone on my hands, every digit of my, of my toes. Um, you know, my kneecap has is, is been broken before. You know, every time I go see a doctor with an injury, he says, that's it, you're, you're done. Well, you know what, for 95% of the population, that's absolutely true. They would be done, but that doctor doesn't know me. He doesn't know how hard I'm willing to fight to do whatever it takes. And, and that's what separates me from everybody else, is I'm not done. I'm, I'm not done. I refuse to be done. If there's anything else I can do, I'm going to do it. And, and that's hard to accept. I've taken a lot of criticism over every step, you know, every measure that I've taken to beat this. I've thrown everything at it I possibly can, and I've taken a lot of criticism for every medication that I could possibly find that might help me uh, to live longer. But there's nobody else in my shoes except for me, and nobody else feels the way I do. Nobody else hurts like I do, um, so I don't see how they can criticize what I do. Talk about tomorrow, talk about the future, talk about your plan to beat this. Let's, let, let's, let's exit this interview on a positive note. Talk about winning. Whatever that means to you, talk about winning. I can tell you tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'm going to feel sick. That's a given. What I do from that point is up to me. If I put a smile on my face, that's up to me. If I decide to get out of bed and go out and have fun, that's up to me. That's up to nobody else except for nobody else gets to make that decision except for me. And that's my plan for tomorrow. And when tomorrow's over, that's my plan for the next day. Whatever that holds. I don't care if I'm stuck in the hospital, if I'm sitting at home on the couch, if I'm in the gym. If I, if I come in here this week and get the deadlift 800 pounds, that's up to me. I'm going to have fun. And nobody else is going to stop me from living my life, from having fun, and just being me. Talk a bit about being you, because I think it's interesting. You keep on talking, you keep on separating yourself from other people, which I can agree and I can attest to, and I'm sure. But what what do you think makes you you? What makes you tick? What makes you different than than other people who are not beating this? or beating this the way you are? What, what, what separates you from everybody else? What makes you so special? And I don't say that in a sarcastic way, I say that in a sincere way. What makes you so special? And really think about that. Give me an honest answer. I'm not special. That's the honest truth. There's nothing special about me. You know, I'm sick. My body is dying. It's shutting down system by system. I think I have an understanding of people who struggle and what I see in society, newspapers, the news on the internet is criticism. Everybody wants to point the finger at somebody else and say, you're different than me. You're wrong. Um, and I think, you know, I just understand that everybody is in a situation. A lot of people are in a situation that I can't understand. Um, I don't criticize people. You know, I'd rather give somebody a, a handshake and, and a hug and say, I understand, man. It's okay. You know, I get you. I understand. If I can't, if I can't help you, I shouldn't criticize you. But I'm not special. There's nothing special about me. If you could give a message to the people that are out there living with this thing every day, feeling sick, 
every day feeling hopeless and afraid every day if you could give them one message right now encouragement or hope what would you say what's your message if I could tell anybody out there that's struggling with a similar situation that I am I just tell them it's okay whatever you feel it's okay and don't let anybody tell you that it's wrong if you're depressed if you're sad if you're mad if you're angry if you're tired it's okay don't let anybody tell you that there's anything wrong with you being who you are you doing what you're doing you're fine don't let anybody criticize you just be you figure out who you are and be nothing more and nothing less than absolutely who you are because at the end of the day you're the only person that you have to go to bed with at night that's who I am